I think the problem that we have with talking about sex a lot is that we have two different energies. We have sex and it's playful, mm -hmm. it's lusty, it's exciting, it's wet, it's mm -hmm. curious, it's fun, it's awkward, but in mm -hmm. a funny way. And then we talk about sex and it's filled with insecurities and ego and it's stiff and it's competitive and it's dry, mm -hmm. right? She'll probably be shocked as hell that I'm sitting down here with you. I'm sure many people would be. <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know what well, they are, they haven't been listening. We don't know how to do relationship because we don't really know one another. We really are not in a place to where we understand who you are or who I am. And I think it's fascinating because it should make life a little bit interesting now because you get to learn some new stuff. Now, if you're a person that doesn't like to learn, if you like to be, those are the people who are having the problems with this whole thing. They're like, why are y'all talking about relationships all the time? Well, because if you're going to do something, you should want to be better at it. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to sit down with you because your content is the way guys on my side will look for, for women. Yes. My, my stats would say it's for women. Yeah. Yeah, I can be very clear about that. Well, yeah, I mean, and the thing is, all right, so what do you think men misunderstand or misinterpret about women and sexuality? I think that men have the number one thing is that there's a very big difference in mm -hmm. that women don't have sexual desire or women aren't horny. Women don't experience sexual desire and fantasies the same way that they do. Mm -hmm. And as a result, women are supposed to be the defenders of monogamy and the protectors of purity. And if she's not, then she's not a good woman. Whereas a man has the space to be the gamut of things when it comes to a sexual person, that they can be overly sexual, that they can be underly sexual. I mean, maybe that's not true because an underly sexual man often, of course, also will get criticized. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there is this assumption that men's sexuality is diverse and each person has their own story, but women's sexuality is a monolith. Well, and as we were kind of talking before this began, going li listening to my mother and her friends talk about sex and sexuality, I learned quickly that that wasn't true. Then I always refer back in my college experience when I had a sorority use my condo, my townhome, for a lock-in. And I listened to a whole weekend of how these women were talking about, I was shocked. Because when if a man likes a woman, it's like, hey man, what happened with you and old girl? The less we say that, the more we like you. And people are like, oh yeah, you know, we kicked it. Okay, we don't ask further questions. Um, but when the women, I noticed they were, they would size, taste this, that, that. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I, I was shell shocked. You said that was the encouragement for you to study sex. Well, I, I'd already started. I, I, I got the Kama Sutra when I was a, you know, preteen. It was further confirmed when I was at school, and when I went back to campus on that Monday, and I'm walking around looking at all these guys. Some who thought they were ladies' men were great in bed. I'm like, oh, oh, you have no idea what they really think about you. And I, and I, it made me curious. So we started talking about relationships uh, in the 90s when Shaharazad Ali's book dropped, The Black Man's Guide to Understand a Black Woman. It became a big thing for us to start talking about relationships. And from that point on, I didn't know at the time because I was still young, uh, that there was such a, such a disconnect. Um, but we could go on about that one forever. But I have one question. That one thing I want to hear your opinion on, uh, and my audience might be shocked. There's this notion about a woman's body count. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is the science behind it? I mean, okay. Talk to my audience about body count. Because I, really, I don't even know how to frame the question. God, before having a child. So a lot of guys seem to operate like this. The more she has sex, the less tight she will be. The She can't pair bond, you know, this, that. And I'm hearing data and stuff on both sides, but what are the, what are the misconceptions or the misunderstand, the misnomers? What are the misses of body count? I think if I thought about this, there's an incredible book that is called What Women Want by Daniel Bergner. And it's mm -hmm. essentially a collection of sex research that promotes the idea that women's sexuality and women's sexual desire is equivalent, if not greater than a man's. That on a woman, she has the body part, which is the clitoris, which is the only known body part 
which only function as pleasure. Yep. And as a result, women also have so much sexual access. And they did this incredible study where they hooked up both like a physiologic, it's called a, please help me out, the plesometa. It's a mechanism that studies that um, rates your heart rate, it covers your heart rate, and then it's able to figure out like your blood volume and then your pulse rate. So whatever it is, we'll find it's, it out. It's the technology that's also used in smartwatches. So <laughs> they hooked women up to that, which is PPG. And then they also hooked women, uh, had a self-reporting test. And then they had them watch all this porn, uh -huh. various kinds of porn, which we used to think that porn was a male dominated industry for men, by men, that women weren't consumers of it. So that's they not had, true. it's not true at all, which also speaks to the fact that women are turned on by the visual, yeah, they are. which that in itself was something that was debated, I think even a couple of years ago. So they had women watch all this porn and most women self-reported that they were not turned on by it, that they did not enjoy it. And then they found that majority of the women were through the PPG were turned on, that they were showing physiological signs of arousal. Mm -hmm. So that to be said that so much of the socialization around what women are told about their sexuality mm -hmm. constrains and distorts and shapes what their biological is actually telling them. So I think that a lot of women have the potential to be very sexual, to be just as sexual. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is the evolutionary psychology debate that, well, women have the brunt of childcare. And so they have to be more selective in their partnership. While there's truth in that, we have to also acknowledge a woman is ovulating 12 to 24 hours a month. Mm -hmm. Yes, sperm lives for five days, but nonetheless, it's not a constant burden. And mm -hmm. of course, with birth control, those stresses have been alleviated to a massive degree. And the selectivity doesn't mean that you don't have multiple partners. It just might not mean that you have 17 partners mm -hmm. that you're giving a little bit more um, gravitas and gravitas to your choice. So that to be said, I just think that we have to acknowledge that a lot of the socialization, the messages that we tell women about their sexuality is impacting how they're allowing their biological to show up. One of the things that, and this, I think it's kind of maybe more unique to me. I'm just curious about stuff. Um, as you were talking, I'm thinking about the book that you're talking about that I read. Uh, pieces of it, excerpts of it. I haven't read it yet, but I will after today because I'm get, getting more into my reading. But even at the turn of the century, hysteria. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I just, I've studied sex. I mean, and it's like, they're right, they're pro, they're men, are, men believe they're right on some side because it's almost like this Madonna whore thing. Like, if a woman is too sexual, then this. And it's like, well, my issue when I talk to men about female sexuality is what is the outcome you want with a woman? And most guys um, report that they, you know, at some point they may want a serious relationship. I'm like, so what do you really care about body count, this and that? I just don't think we're just, I don't think we talk about sex, truthfully. That's mm -hmm. what it really comes down to. Um, because the people I hear, male side, who don't care about body count tend to be men who are in relationships are married. Mm -hmm. And men I do care, hear talk about body count tend to not have relationships or successful long-term relationships with women. I'm not saying causation. I'm just saying there's a correlation. I'm not saying any causation. I just think there's a huge gap uh, to that end around the early 2000s. Was that when passion parties and all that stuff started really being a thing? Like, is that like a teen trend or passion party? Adult? Passion parties, as I understood it. Okay. So a passion party would be this. Uh, a, a young professional woman uh, would have a friend come over and she would be selling all these different sex toys. Okay. Uh, and, you know, uh, I know someone who had one. I'm not going to say your name. She had one down in Dallas. She invited all her girlfriends over. They you should one. certainly get to send her business. <laughs> well, it's this over. Blow her she, up. She, she's married now. Okay. <laughs> but see, she had she had a bunch of women coming over. She had the wine there, and the women came over with uh, different uh, dildos and things. She, they were learning how to give blowjobs. Yes. And then they were buying, and they were they were putting orders for rabbits and bullets and creams and this and that. And then after the women sat and did their thing, drank whatever, then the men were invited over and then they turned into a, a party party and it was funny. I didn't know that part of it. Yeah. That's a good education. I thought it was just like a Tupperware party that it ended at the sex toy sale. I didn't realize it turned into an orgy. Well, it, see, it turned into a party 
and uh, not an orgy, but it turned into like, it was like, okay, from six to 10 or from seven to 12, we're gonna do this part. And then the men were allowed to come. But come on, they've been drinking, they've been playing with, people were leaving and hooking up. Did you attend some passion parties in Hell your day? yeah. Yeah? I, yeah, I know this, yeah. I have lived a broad life. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't let the suit fool you. Uh, because I'm curious, I'm like. Well, you know, I'm curious about that because I'm like, does that lend itself? Because as we know that Two thirds of women don't achieve orgasm mm -hmm. from penetration alone. Right. And so they need clitoral assistance and stimulation and toys can be a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And that's a very uncomfortable conversation for a lot of cis heterosexual men who've been told that their penis is like gonna put out fires and right. end cancer and give multiple <laughs> orgasms all by itself without any training whatsoever and any knowledge. So that to be said, did these parties lend itself? So it's like, I just bought this new thing. Let's do this together. Like did it open up kinks and uh, yeah, I've heard it did, you know, <laughs> you know, now I want to say there was, you know, I'm not going to lie. There, there were people having sex in that one, in one room one time, but really it was, it opened up the conversation because I may have to host some passion parties. Well, because here's the thing you see a, a, an attorney or an accountant or someone in marketing and you, and you see these women all the time. And then, and instead of going to the club or doing what they're over, having a passion party and they're learning how to, how are you going to do it? How are you going to practice? So it's like, well, all right. They were choosing to get involved in these sexual relationships. Uh, yeah. And guys, here's the funny thing. Men did not want to attend the same kind of parties. It's like, you know, so you're talking about uh, most women report not reaching orgasm. You ask, a, you ask a guy about a female orgasm and they think it's penetration, mm -hmm. purely. Uh, some guys think it's clitoral. You ask a guy where a G-spot is. Most of them are like, what is that? Or the Freudian approach, which is if it's not penetration, then you're immature. Right. That you haven't been able to, you're not a woman yet. See, and we have so much, and here's the thing, especially coming from the Midwest and the Bible Belt, we have so much shame and stuff associated with sexuality. I'm like, all right. Can we talk about it in a clinical sense to where you can understand it, to where if you do decide, even if you're married to your wife and she's a virgin and you're a virgin, why don't you just be good at it? Um, and I think, especially um, from my side, I think the bigger issues is where there is no common ground, there's no common knowledge, there's a lot of fear. And I've said this before, fear, scarcity, and lack lead to anxiety and stress. And there's a lot of stress with men around uh, sex, first time sex. A lot of guys report um, it's in this incel movement, not not movement, phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, not wanting to disrobe in front of a woman because she feels like he's had sexual partners and he's not going to quote unquote measure up. Mm -hmm. I'm like, where are we getting all of these things from? Do we have, do we have too much sexual information, not enough sexual information, or are we getting the wrong sexual information? It feels like what's happening right now is there is not enough sexual information for one portion of the population and a lot of sexual information for another. Okay. And so I have gone to school for sex mm -hmm. various times in my life. I became a sex ed counselor and then mm -hmm. I got an associate and then I became a sexologist and then I've gone to so many classes. 90, all classes I've been have been women dominated. Mm -hmm. And some of the times you might see a smattering of men and majority of those men are married. Mm -hmm. So that to be said that I also understand from a um, young man's perspective that you're not encouraged to learn, that you're given this burden of responsibility that like, if you're a man, you just know what to do. And so you also, I think as a result of that, wanna limit how much information your partner has, cause it's a natural insecurity that you might have of like, man, I'm supposed to go in there and beat up the pussy and give her 17 orgasms. <laughs> and I can barely even hold on for 30 seconds on my own, let alone in partnered play. So the idea of controlling that person's experiences that, that they don't have more knowledge or something to compare you to sounds logical in that case. So I wish that there were more opportunities for men. Cause I can't even list to you, especially for black men, like who's teaching black men about how to be better lovers. Well, um, Who's I've, making it accessible? Who's making it cool? Who's making it relaxed? Like who's leading this dialogue or leading a male no sexual one. liberation movement? Well, I, I mean, I've said it before a couple of friends. I was like, we should open fucking school. I mean, you talk about opening wife school and charm school. I'm like, we should, because there's so much about sex school. We should open sex school. So I've used that there. Show them a sex school. Um, 
Although yeah. this is a fucking school, is it? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but you know, but yeah, because I'm like, there's so many guys who just you're supposed to be sexual pro, and the older you get, and the less sexual experience, the more it becomes. A lot of guys are just. I spent two years talking to incels and make out incels. Uh, Self-identified. That's how they they identify. When our when our one on one sessions, yeah, mm. and, you know, and these guys were, I would say, eighty percent were college educated. The vast majority earning seventy thousand dollars. Socially, they looked like, but the inability to go out and what we would consider meet a woman and progress into some sort of romantic relationship. Some guys report of having have had having had sex in high school and or college, but when you delve into it, it was usually a woman who was kind of she was kind of leading the process. He couldn't. "Quote unquote, make it happen." It wasn't that they wanted to. It's just because the longer it happened, guys started feeling insecure and became like a an Ouroboros that just ate on itself. Next thing you know, Steve, what is it? Forty year version with Steve, whatever, it became a real thing. And I was ignorant to this, but when I would start hosting my show, I would have more guys calling in. These men, in my experience, want relationship. They want. Uh, Romantically significant, emotionally fulfilling relationships and a sexual relationship. They have female friends. They're often in the friend zone, but they just, there's a disconnect there. And no one's teaching this. No one's talking to it. And a big part of it is that fear of not knowing how to do stuff. It's admitting, right? Because, I mean, how many people would be comfortable, how many men would be comfortable reading a book on the subway that said, you know, how to please a woman? Well, you know, it's <laughs> not many. Um, but it's also, who, where are you going to go to try it out? You know, I'm a fan of legalizing the sex trade. Mm -hmm. Legalize it. I mean, uh, regulate it. Um, I don't want to see, you know, trafficking and all that kind of crazy stuff. But, you know, I call the oldest profession for anything. Um, there's, I think there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of, I don't want to say ignorance, misunderstanding on men's side. Because even when I sit down and talk to guys, I know I've studied and looked at it a hell of a lot more than they have uh, because I actually just, I'm a scientist at heart. I find it kind of interesting. But there's that part, and then there's translate, uh, actually getting it done in the real world. Here's another part. We talked about the, we talked about sex as, a, as an act. We, uh, and let's talk about other components. Foreplay, we'll get to that. Intimate, erotic, dirty talk. Mm -hmm. Extremely difficult for most men. Yes, for people. It's another language. Yes. Spanish is hard, mm -hmm. right? It, it is an entirely other language in itself, and it's a language that you've been probably conditioned to know your whole life is bad. These are words that you don't say unless you want to offend somebody. So if I'm in the most intimate space with that person, these aren't the words that come to mind for me, number one. Number two, I mean, I don't even know any other words. Well, and I will say, for me, I had to learn. I'm a, I'm a, I think I'm a pretty good communicator. That one, I had to learn because uh, I'm glad I did because for women, uh, especially women I've dealt with, that's been an, that's been an important part of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I said there's just so much of this that we're, we're all expected to just know this stuff. So you mentioned you were a sex ed teacher? No, I went to various sex ed counselor. Sex ed counselor. When I was in school, we actually had sex ed. Mm -hmm. I don't think sex ed is still in schools. Well, it's called health. And it's called health? Yeah, it's a part of health, yeah. Now, I remember when th that film where a woman gave birth and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I want to look that up. I don't know if it's still... Jared, you watched it in school. Yeah. Okay. Now, are you guys... You went from Canada? Yes, from Canada. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to look this one up. Because... The sheer amount of not knowing. And men, we are big on respect and our egos are huge. We don't like to not know how to do stuff. So it's it's intrinsic to a lot of guys. If we don't know, we shy away. Um, Especially in an area that you've been told is so tightly tied with your masculinity. Especially as a black man. Especially as a black man. You're supposed to be a, you're supposed to be a sexual pro. Yes, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And that and and I talk about these issues when I talk to men. I was like, I've actually started speaking about it. Stop putting that burden on yourself that you're a sex pro. You're not a 
porn star. You, you don't play football at the pro level. You, you know, come on. Because we have to start getting to a point to where it is so foreign to where people are just comfortable to not try. Because while we do have a lot of information, I think we're also at a point to where we have so much information. It's almost like people are becoming numb because like, what am I supposed to do with this? And they don't even know how to do the initial thing. Hi, how are you? Hey, how are you? Let's mm. go out and do that. Um, Which is why Dirty Talk is actually probably if you make the fucking school, um, <laughs> it should be the first course that you take because that is the gateway to the dance that has to happen. Communicating what you like, what you don't like. Taking the things that you read on some Instagram carousel that said there's an e-spot, which is what I saw today. I've mm. never heard of that letter before for the female anatomy. E-spot? E. Oh. Today I heard about the e-spot. Um, so how do we take this language that we see and then turn it into constructive dialogue in the bedroom? And that's where dirty talk can help do that. I think the problem that we have with talking about sex a lot is that we have two different energies. We have sex and it's playful, mm -hmm. it's lusty, it's exciting, it's wet, it's mm -hmm. curious, it's fun, it's awkward, but in mm -hmm. a funny way. And then we talk about sex and it's filled with insecurities and ego and it's stiff and it's competitive and it's dry. So, <laughs> and one of the bigger things coming from the Bible Belt, getting women to openly be truthful and admit what they really like, getting men to understand and trying it. Y'all talk one way with one another and then over here, just like you're talking about the self-reporting, you're saying no, but the test is saying something else. So maybe that should be part of the sex school. Looking you up to a monitor and finding out what you really like. There's levels to this though. Are you, are you familiar with like horrible decisions? Uh, no. Well, it's, well, they're a, a female podcast. Yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah, yeah. She hates me. Really? Yeah, there's she, two of them. Well, it's not Mandy and yes, there's another. Yeah, and the, Weezy. Yeah, she hates me. According to, she was on Adam 22, no jumper. She thinks I'm a horrible person. It's not a horrible person. You just don't know me. Right. She'll probably be shocked as hell that I'm sitting down here with you. I'm sure many people would be. <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know. Well, if they are, they haven't been listening. Well, I'm obsessed with this topic and I am <laughs> fascinated by it. And I want to be a part of the dialogues people are having. And you are leading many of those dialogues. So to not be ears open, it doesn't mean that we can't have discourse. But there's it's an undeniable impact that you've had in this space. And this is a space I care about. I think it's easier for... Women, uh, like th they're extremes on both sides. And I've said this before. There's 10% over here, 10% over here, and then there's 80% in the middle. The middle, roughly the middle ground. But when nothing is happening, if you're not, let's say um, we've just had the great resignation, right? So many people have decided, fuck this shit, I'm out. Leaving corporate America, downsizing, right-sizing, whatever, because they're starting to prioritize quality of life, relationships, interpersonal stuff over the hustle and bustle. Now, we've had things that have become, to make it easier, you know, distance working and things like that, make it, you know, more acceptable. But now, so now people have choice. You have a choice. And same thing in the sexual marketplace and the dating marketplace. If you're on this extreme or that extreme, it's easy to be a, a rabbit this or a diehard that. When the actuality is you want a relationship, you just want it to, you don't want it to fail. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest points of failure I've heard from women is, you know, things were going right, but the sexual thing wasn't right. And guys need to know that this is something they can do something about before it ends and it's just irreconcilable differences or something like that. So here's what I wanted to reflect back on you and get your thoughts on this. What I've seen in the dating market, and I think the pain point that's kind of coming right now between men and women is that there's a particular percentage of the, the internet population who's asking women to ask for less mm -hmm. because they're like, your standards are too high, you want too much, and they enjoy seeing those women being told that they need to ask for less. Mm -hmm. But what that women, many of the times are looking for is somebody who's equally yoked, at least bare, bare minimum financially, mm -hmm. right? So if they have re achieved a certain level of success, they're looking for a partner who is like also achieving financial success. And then sexually, women have become liberated. Mm -hmm. They are learning more about their bodies. They are becoming more vocal about that. And as a result, maybe they're having more partners. And then men, instead of saying, I'm also gonna liberate and educate myself, they're asking women for less. 
Okay. They're saying you should have less sexual partners. You should be less curious. So instead of rising to the occasion to meet women where they are in the advancements, they're asking women to come back down a notch. Okay. Uh, what was the question you want me to respond? The point you want me to respond to? I think the, ref do you th think a part of the problem here is that men don't have role models and don't have educators and don't know where to go. And instead of seeking those out or doing a self-education process, they think that the solution is to get women who are getting ahead in this area to come back down to their level. Are we talking about, okay, let's talk about the first one, the, the advancement piece of it and see if we can get it all in one place. Um, I think that's one of the things that separated my content. Cause when I start talking about this high value man is not a Kevin Samuels creation. It's, it's been around forever. I've heard women talk about it for years, men talk about it for years. I just kind of put some parameters around it. Um, and right, wrong, or indifferent, when talking to women, especially these days, they tend to want men who traditionally would be considered to fall in the top 20%, the Petro principle, okay? Because I think I heard you also mention something about, you know, men need to step up, they're underachieving, we need to get more guys in college and things like that. And... I'm talking about the guys who are already in that position, maybe from a uh, resource standpoint, or at least a mindset to get those kind of resources. Um, they tend to have more, um, I don't want to say options, but. But I guess there's like the, to go off topic, but there's the golden penis syndrome, which is a term that's used yeah, yeah, to I describe the yeah, dynamics right now, mm -hmm. which is that, Women since the 1980s have been graduating from post-secondary schools. And now actually since the 2000s are graduating with doctorates at a higher rate than yeah, men are. PhD. Yeah, so and not to say that, of course, that education is the way to a better life, but sociology will tell you that this is closest to the sure shottest way. Maybe that's changed with crypto, I'm not quite sure, but nonetheless that women are giving themselves an undeniable base for earning potential and because men aren't coming to universities and colleges, that that's a part of it. So you've got men who have golden penis syndrome that if you are financially well off or you are university educated and you are in a position to have similar earning potential, there's less of you. So women have to compete for you more. I think there's, this is where the mismarketing I think comes into play because according to the numbers, like one, especially in the black community, we got like women have $1.7 trillion in debt. So when it's all sorted out, the average black man is earning 40,500. 40, the average black woman is earning 37,000. So the average white man earning 51,000. So like there's $11,000 difference. So regardless of the education, the numbers, men are still out earning women. Um, we don't also factor in a lot of guys are choosing not to go to college, they're choosing to go to trade school. Because we have a, you know, uh, science, technology, engineering, math um, are careers where you can actually increase your amount of earnings versus if you just went to business administration, yes, communication, agreed. things like that. So, but STEM would be a part of the education. I guess have to look into the, the earning potential because I know specifically for black women who are amongst one of the most educated groups. And I went to an HBCU mm -hmm. and I could tell you anecdotally the difference in earnings and the difference that I see in general in terms of representation mm -hmm. when I go to corporations. So mm -hmm. I'm interested, I'm fascinated, especially well, given the incarceration rate that black men are out earning well, black women. There's a there's a website that you and your fan, your viewers can look at. It's called blackdemographics.com. So they, they take the bureau, uh, data from the uh, Bureau of Label Statistics, uh, Department of Health, the census. Uh, in the black community, 74% of black women earn less than $50,000. Only 9% earn more than $74,000. And then, you know, it is not uncommon, like on my show, to hear women who are, who are 50, 100, 200, $400,000 in debt. Yes. So I agree that college for some uh, is a, indi a potential indicator of future success. Where the rubber meets the road, it tends to come down into the actual dollars. And what the issue tends to be is women, I don't know, hypergamy. Women tend to want men to have uh, equally yoked what they want. So one of the bigger issues, especially in the 90s, were white-collar women not wanting to date blue-collar men. Mm -hmm. 
motherfucker, please, you work for UPS. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You're working for a firm downtown, but I'm working for UPS or GM, and I'm making 70000 and you're making 40000 That's what I was going to say. The debt thing, because I'm in a million dollars of debt. I own a home. Right. So is that, does that, would I- No, it's count? college debt. It's college debt. It's f- student loan debt. Okay. So I, I guess, um, and, and the biggest thing, especially like, there's a there's a study called uh, Black Men Make It in America by the American Enterprise Institute. 54% of black men, single, childless, 61% in the middle class, and 2.5 million in the upper class. The thing black men have been told for the longest is you're underperforming, you're undereducated, and not keeping up. But that's where I kind of started getting interested because I'm like, I look around and see a lot of guys like myself who are unmarried, who want relate, who wanted relationship. Mm-hmm. But in our, and this is where we kind of get into more cultural or racial things. In our particular community, it's not really mirrored or, or it's not really, we're not really taught this stuff. So our relationship tend to be mirrored to us by athletics, entertainment, musicians, young, youth. So 30 and under, you look at the space between 31 and up, where are the role models for relationship? And that's why you hear so many people going all the way back to where? The Cosby's. Mm-hmm. Um but so I, I would it really does sound like our audiences should get together because my audience is coastal university educated, mm-hmm. probably high earning in their family, at least, or uh, lifestyle changing in their family, mm-hmm. single women, usually women of color who are struggling to find equally yoked mates. And it sounds like your demographic is made up of something very similar from well, a man's perspective. Give me an example. That's what actually made my show take off because high value so many women start calling in. So if you look at some of my earlier shows before Average at Best, doctor, lawyer, Chicago, New York, Seattle, LA, Dallas, Houston. But what it comes right down to is what I did is I was hearing men equally yoked and women saying, where are all these men? And I'm like, so what I did is I have a Facebook group. It's called The Mix. All I did, I'm not a matchmaker, I took men and asked them a baseline of questions. Age, uh, marital status, do you want marriage? Where do you work? What's your LinkedIn profile? Just some basic stuff. I I kind of vetted them, kind of looked through. Then I asked women, all right? Uh, Same kind of questions, but not as much as men. And most of these people wanted relationships. I put, at the time, 800, 400 men, 400 women in this group, okay? And I kind of just said it over there. I come back, relationship, 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 relationship. There are six marriages that have happened. I posted on my Instagram, an attorney, successful personal injury attorney, Brother Sperling, he's several million dollars. His kids are like, you want children like the kids he has. His boys are in martial arts and foreign languages and this and that, you know. <laughs> And he was a single dad for the longest, a nice man. He has a great relationship with his exes, but he was done. He was about to move to the Dominican Republic. I told him to join my group and he he finally did it. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll join it. In a week, he made his college, he made his Ivy League educated fiance. And now- I need a link to this Facebook group. It sounds phenomenal. Well, and, but my point is, my point is he's here and she was in another part of the country. Now, They are getting married. They just built out this home. He's putting her through law school. It's everything that black women say they wanted. And all I did was put them in proximity. Mm -hmm. I just checked back in on this group yesterday. These women are having brunches, teas, men are networking, business are getting done. And I'm sitting back and I'm finding out about relationships that hadn't happened. And none of the people live in the same place. So what that did is it told me, I'm like, well, we're not that separated. We just don't, we don't know how. No need to 